Welcome back, y'all, to another episode of Black Tea. This is the podcast that is all about Black women in advertising, brought to you by Muse by Clio. As usual, I'm your host, Michelle Lawrence. So glad to be here today and happy to welcome Ginger Birkin Buell. Welcome, Ginger. Hi, thanks for having me, Michelle. I'm so excited to be here. Can you tell everybody what you do and where you're based? Yes. Well, I am based in wonderful, rainy Chicago, a windy city. My company is Burke Creative, so I'm the president and CEO of this company. Um, and we specialize in brand strategy, thought leadership, advertising, media buying, um, some design work, um, but mostly turnkey full service. Um, I also have a podcast called The Honest Field Guide, which I launched, um, I think it was in 2018. So I interview um, executive women and men, but executive women like yourself to sort of understand how they got to where they got, because most of the people I talk to have not, we're not planning on being creative people and they became creative people. You're, you always want to hear that origin story. Um, and then I'm a, a songwriter in a country band called Utah Carol. Um, and that's a band that I launched with my husband a while back. And um, we have three records and we have some new songs that we've just released. And um, I'm a real big proponent of intellectual property. So we own the entire platform for the band. Amazing. And then um, the last thing is um, in a tw- during the pandemic, um, I saw so many small business owners um, really not being prepared for uh, the pandemic and what it brought, especially in terms of the online marketing and the online platforms that were required to continue to make money. So I decided I needed to put something together to help these individual people, um, you know, understand what to do to launch their businesses. So I launched a nonprofit called Journey of Gratitude. And, um, uh, you know, it's still needed, right? A lot of us, a lot of uh, black and and brown business owners are still struggling, um, you know, from the the effects of the pandemic. Wow. Wow. Okay. So you have a lot of brands, a handful of brands under Burke Creative. Um, I want to, you kind of just did it, but help our viewers wrap our, wrap their heads around everything you do and everything you own and how it all fits together. Do these companies, these brands talk to each other and how, <laughs> how did you, how did you find yourself uh, involved with this smattering of passions? Well, I love that question for a multitude of reasons. Um, I think when I first started out in, you know, the professional creative space, um, and I know, you know, we talk and we hear about this all the time. I really thought, oh my gosh, I am the only black person in this room anywhere. And I'm not only the only black person, I'm the only woman. So Mm -hmm. this this is just really a lot. And not saying that it wasn't an experience I couldn't manage, but it's just an experience I didn't want to manage. I was like, I don't want to be in this this doing this. And I also didn't have access to the brain trust of any of the companies I worked for, right? So I didn't have direct access to the client for a multitude of reasons. Um, half of the reasons really, in my in my humble opinion, are related to people in the middle that are mostly there to protect their jobs and to ensure that they keep their jobs. And so they're not necessarily sharing all the information that you need to make the right creative decisions. Mm -hmm. Um, You may have missed a little detail that would have gotten you to a better solution. So um, I realized at some point that I needed to, you know, control my own intellectual property and ideas and launch my own business. And it took a long time to do that. It was scary at first, um, but I am a creative strategist and a creative thinker. And I've always sort of been entrepreneurial in my approach in in a lot of aspects of my life. And I decided to open my business after my last job where my boss, she was a woman boss, she was amazing. And she said, you know what, Ginja? One day you're gonna make a lot of money in this business. You were really creative, you're really smart, but this is, you gotta figure out what you want. And I was like, you know what? You're right, I do have to figure out what I want. I don't want this. Like, I don't want to, you know, build things for other people. I want to build things for myself. And so I launched my own business in 1997. And from there, I then launched my band. And um, over time, I've launched other brands, some that have failed and some that haven't. And so the ones I have now that I mentioned are the ones that have, you know, made it through the test of time and even the test of my passion to keep it going. They've survived that process. Yeah. Um, so, um, and they do all work together because fundamentally they're all creative strategy there's it's all creative strategy work right maybe except for the band which is more it's definitely creative writing songs but it's not as you know it's not 75 percent business 25 percent creative it's really mostly creative with you know my piece of business coming in but for the most part all of these these uh brands that i've launched you know do feed into my agency burke creative as a content strategy you know leadership company so um that's really what's going on with that wow okay 
That's a lot. And I love that um, to uh, to kick it all off. Uh, it kind of started with mentorship and the mentorship of your boss. I know that um, something that mentorship is something that you value, but you say that we should be looking to attract a mentor. Um, why should we be looking to attract a mentor? And how does one do that? How does one attract a mentor? Yes. Wow, that is always that is always a, a a loaded, wild, but so important question. It really depends on where you are in your career. What stage are you? Um, because there is such a thing as being mentored to death and then you don't move forward and go anywhere. At some point you have to convert that to, I need to actually go to the next level and you know find um, um, a sponsor or an advisor. It really is making sure that you're in the right rooms and surrounding yourself with the right people. And I say right people, I mean, people that are striving to get ahead and moving forward in positive ways and positive places people that are very understanding of you when they when they see you out working and they're like oh you know she's working or he's working so we understand the purpose and the goal of this person and letting them be themselves and doing the things that they need to do to get where they're going right. the other thing i would suggest if you're looking for mentors is really to join a board when you join a nonprofit board um, you really can find people that are living their lives and working with purpose because they're there not only for their career development, but they're also there to do things to help other people. So you can then look around the room and look at the table and say, okay, who can I talk to or who will um, you know, take a 15 minute conversation with me? Don't ever go to someone and say, will you be my mentor? Just say, you know, I really do have some questions. I need some guidance. I'm looking for help in this area. I really think based on what I've learned about you, what I've read about you um, in the article that you just published last week, um, I think you could give me some ideas. Would you mind taking a 15 minute, you know, a tea break with me and help me understand what to do? And, you know, those are the ways to sort of start the conversation. And the last thing I'll say about mentoring is you don't have to find people that look like you as a mentor. And you definitely shouldn't be afraid to look, seek out people that do not look like you at all. You, you just be amazed at how much creativity lives in um, unexpected places that are really, you know, definitely not within the narrative that you were raised to believe. Uh, can you talk about Change Maker Village and what motivated you to publish that? After the murder of George Floyd, well, Mel Caspin Bloom, who's been writing books for a long time, she said, I got to do something. She says, I can't live in this world. I can't raise my children in this world. So she put a post on LinkedIn and it was so interesting. The post was really like 10 or 20 tips on what you could do to change you know, your life and your perspective. And so I said, you know, you're missing something really important. I said, I, I would like for you to, you know, acknowledge and recognize that one of the things that you should be adding to your list is support, champion, work with, hire, contract with Black women to help you understand what's actually happening and to really enhance all the things that you're trying to do. And I thought, you know, I'm going to put this out here. You know, she's probably going to be like, put some crazy message on LinkedIn. I'm going to destroy my, you know, my reputation. But that didn't happen. She actually reached out to me privately and said, you know what? You're right. I need to learn some things. I, I love this. And I said, I would, I'll, I'll certainly ha hop on a phone call with you. So we got in a phone call and I found out that she actually was an author, but she didn't really have control over intellectual property. So I have a publishing company called Burke Digital as well, where I do consulting to help people publish their books. And I said, you know what, let's do this. Let me help you. Um, first of all, understand how you need to have your own publishing platform, number one. But number two, you want to write a book and I want to write a book too. So let's collaborate together. Um, I was actually able to help her understand how she should be presenting a little black girl in the book. And so I really worked as the cultural editor on the book. And, and I also helped her understand how to launch her own publishing platform. So, I, so now she can publish her own books. And if she sells a million copies, maybe one day she'll end up on the New York Times bestseller list. I mean, I'm really glad you asked because that's really a passion place for me to help um, women specifically um, you know, use their voice and understand how they can get it out there in ways and control the platforms that their voices are on. I mean, and then find ways to monetize that if you'd like, you know, so there's all different kinds of ways to do things and to collaborate, especially if you're in a space like I am where you want to, um, you really want to talk about issues related to equality and diversity and, and women empowerment. That's amazing. Um, definitely, I feel like ownership is is the through line theme of this episode. And, and it really just kind of runs through every vein in your body, everything that you touch, you sense to not only own uh, what's yours, but also to teach others to own what's theirs. I think that's beautiful. You're in a band with your husband, which is so cute. Do you play an instrument? Are you a vocalist? We were working on a project to reach out to do some digital transformation. It was like hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I thought, Oh my God, this could feed a village. Like, what am I doing? And so I picked up the guitar and my husband already was a guitar player. 
Um, so I wrote a couple songs and I was like, at one point I was copying off of Janet Jackson. He's like, no, you can't sing like that. That's like not your voice. I'm like, you know, you're right. But anyway, I started playing music and I took some classes at the Old Town School of Folk Music. And um, I had a really great teacher named Ralph Coburg and he encouraged me to write more songs. And I wrote my first song at the Old Town School of Folk Music and performed on stage. And I took my husband with me on stage and I said, you're coming with me. He's like, no, I'm not. I'm like, if you don't come with me, we're going to have to divorce because I'm going up there to play and you are too. So that was kind of the start of the band. And then we formed Utah Carol, put a record out and we got really fortunate because um, back in those days, and I am dating myself, um, record labels had not penetrated the advertising industry and art directors had a lot of autonomy over choosing songs. They weren't really locked into, you know, Warner Brothers records, right? Um, you know, it was just a whole different industry, a whole different industry, a whole different opportunity for creative people like yourself and me, where we could decide, I want that independent song in my, in my, in my advertising campaign. So we actually, through my marketing, I was actually able to put our records out professionally and, you know, we own the IP and we got a bunch of advertising contracts because of it. It was amazing. I mean, I think one year we made $25,000 on an ad campaign by just licensing four songs. That is a world that doesn't exist anymore for independent artists. It's very difficult to make that happen. But I launched the band online. So, you know, we still actually, believe it or not, songs that we wrote 25 years ago are still ending up in, you know, commercials or something. You know, you have to have an outlet when you're in this business. Um, when you're Black, especially, um, you have to do other things because you can get laned out so fast. One wrong move, man, you're you're done. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's so much pressure on us. So it's, it's helpful if you have other outlets to express yourself. It's it's imperative, I think. Um, and yeah. that's I'm not disregarding some superstars in the business, right? Um, but especially if you're on your own versus working for a large corporation, you really do have to um, I think someone recently said, um, if you're a jack of all trades, it's difficult to get a job in a corporate environment because they don't want jack of all trades. They want, you know, one lane people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is tough. Um, and you carved your own lane or you've carved your own freeway and it's about eight lanes wide. And I love that. <laughs> I love that. Can I use that? <laughs> you take it. You take it. Um, <laughs> I want to know the project or campaign that you are most proud of to date. It could be a, an entity. It could be a particular campaign. Um, what is, if you had to pick one thing uh, that you're most proud of as, as the shining example of your career success, what would you pick? So the, the most like emotional, valuable, powerful campaign I've ever worked on in my life was actually a, a, a big uh, experience I did for Advocate Health, which at the time was called Advocate Healthcare, but they've rebranded to Advocate Health. And this was during the pandemic. And Advocate Health recognized that they needed to do better with reaching the black and brown community. Brown community meaning in Chicago, specifically in Illinois, Latinos that, you know, speak Spanish, right, in, in different communities. This was an exciting project for me because it first started off as a media buying project. Was, and so I, instead of that, I said, you know, I don't know if billboards are the, the answer need to be in the community um, where people are walking around, you know, taking buses or trying to get to the store. You know, so, helping them understand how to reach the um, Hispanic community in Illinois was was a whole new thing. And and you know what, what it ended up doing, Michelle? They realized during this assignment to help reach underrepresented communities that um, they were like, wow, you know, we actually can use these strategies to reach people in the rural communities as well, because we're actually, you know, there's other segments that we have to start, you know, communicating with. So that was, that was one of those like, psh, you know, light bulb moments for everybody like, oh my gosh, you mean if you help us, you help everybody? So there's a whole different uh, level of sort of communication um, that I helped them understand they needed to deploy in order to reach communities that they needed to make a real change with. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that story with our viewers today. It's been amazing to have you. And I'm drinking my English breakfast tea right now. Yes. The reason I was excited about the show is because I love the name Black Tea and yes. I want to understand why you named it that. Well, okay. I don't, nobody's ever asked this question before. Um, tea having a couple of double meanings. One is the, you know, the the colloquial tea that we all sip, meaning your secrets, your stories, you know, dispelling um, experiences and really just kind of spilling the tea. The other thing I like about black tea is that it is not a single uh, shaped leaf. 
it is not one thing, right? If you look inside a little tea bag, especially a black tea bag, those are complex. They've got notes, they've got cinnamon, they've got clove, they've got all of these other things that are playing together to sort of steep and create a moment. And I think that's what our experiences are. So putting that all together in a space where people can really sip and indulge that, I think it's both energizing to us as Black women to see each other that way. But I think it's also a learning experience for folks that are not in our culture, but that are in our industry and want to sort of learn more about the experience. I love it. Thank Thank you you so much. Thank you for sharing that with me. I really appreciate it. It's so great. Of course. And everybody out there watching, thank you so much for watching this episode of Black Tea. Please do divulge in all the other episodes at musebycleo.com slash black tea and follow us on Instagram at sipblacktea. And we will see y'all next time. Bye.